stones jutting out of the ground. And you see more of Puma Punku under the ground. And they've only gone down right there at that site. They've only gone down, uh, I can't remember, maybe, maybe four feet, five feet down into these rectangular concaves in the ground where they're, where they're excavating. And the very first thing that I thought when I walked up was, why in the world did they stop? That was the very first thing that came to mind. Why did they stop? A lot of people will go to Pumapunku and will, will concoct these wild speculative conjectures about aliens and that the H-blocks were used for landing pads or, a, or a, uh, a, a runway for alien craft and it was, you know, an alien base. And, all. And, and, I mean, it's really laughable. With all due respect to those guys, it's really illogical and laughable when you're actually standing in Puma Punku because anybody with half a brain is going to recognize immediately that this thing is under the ground. Whatever it is, it's, it, what we're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Whatever was there is under the ground. And for some reason, the Bolivian government does not want to delve further into it. It was, it was just a couple little rectangles pulling up some of the H-blocks, and that's it. I mean, that is the first thing that hit us immediately when we walked up there. And uh, I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was going to be a well-excavated area. You would think that, wow, they found this amazing uh, architecture, these, these unexplainable you know, megalithic blocks. You'd think that they would delve deeper into it, want to uncover it and try and figure out what it is. That is not the case at all. They give you a little peek. It's like pulling the corner of the curtain back, giving you just a little peek, and that's it. They don't even let you touch the stones anymore. We did, of course. We distracted what? the guards. And, 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 I mean, you know. But anyway, we, we, what we discovered in these, the, the, these constructions, and this is visible, obviously, uh, in, uh, this is visible in a lot of documentaries that have been made, is, is the, the, the absolute precision that you find in Puma Punku. And uh, I'm getting to the difference between Puma Punku and Tiwanaku, but I want to describe for people the precision at Puma Punku so that when I talk about Tiwanaku, they understand the difference that, we're, that, we're, that we illustrate in the documentary. The, the Puma Punku, for example, the famous H-blocks, uh, uh, you see in a lot of the documentaries out there how sharp the right angles that are incorporated in andesite. This is andesite, you know, one of the hardest rocks on earth, and they, they, somehow they were able to craft these stones, to, to, to cut these stones with, uh, with such precision. I mean, we are talking about exact, perfect right angles that, that are still, some of them are still in pristine condition to this day. And the, the, um, the engineer Mario from Puno, from the university that was with us, something he was telling us on the way there was that he also has another theory that they were able to vitrify the surface. Whoever built Puma Punku was able to vitrify the surface of the stone. Well, when we got there, this was evident. I mean, this was clearly evident. There's no doubt about it. The stone, the surface of the stones, whatever this structure is, it's probably a whole city under the ground right there, that they, vit, they were able to vitrify the surfaces of the stones. Absolutely incredible. In other words, when you run your hand over some of the stones that are less weathered, you, you literally feel like you're running your hand over a glass table. It's vitrified. It's not just cut. It's vitrified. That's a whole other level of technology. So immediately when you, when you walk up to Puma Punku and you start touching the stones, uh, you recognize that, hey, this, this is high technology. There's no doubt about it. And that's probably why they don't want you touching the stones anymore because that's what that's – I mean, again, anybody with half a brain – is, is going to realize, wait a minute, the, this, we're dealing with something here that, that is, in, in, in terms of conventional history, impossible. It's, impo it's an impossibility. Right that, now, that, Tim, you know, Tim, yeah, let me interrupt you because this is important. Vitrification can only be achieved, even in antiquity, by intense heat, i.e. by super intense heat. And, Doug, I don't know if you and Joe and others have seen the picture in some of the Mayan, Inca, and Aztecs. It almost looks like there's a guy with a backpack and a blowtorch on his back. Have you ever seen those? Well, the reason why this is critical, when Tim is at, at uh, Tiwanaku and, and, and uh, Punapunko, the thing is, is that 
I, I, within, let's see, probably on Thursday of this week, they announced that they have found a level of mercury. Now, this is going to be fascinating between some of the oldest pyramids in different places in the world uh, and pyramids in mercury go hand in hand from the standpoint of in the ancient Indian myths. And this is why we're talking about this stuff. You guys out there in listening land, we're equipping you with what I believe will be an amazing revelation to be able to answer the skeptics when they come out with all their nonsense. But what's fascinating, mercury in antiquity, especially 4000 B.C., in the Indian Rama Empire, was always associated with the flight. That was one of the propellants and the Vimana flying craft. And if everybody thinks this is wacky, the Indian aerospace equivalent of NASA presented thousands of pages of documents to a space symposium, and some people laughed. It was interesting. The ones that knew what they were talking about and those are all the boys from the three-letter agencies with no clearance, uh, even no known clearance levels that most people would be familiar with didn't laugh. And so what's fascinating is, just as there are pyramids now, to my knowledge, the presence of mercury, vitrification is what happens when sand is turned to glass in an atomic bomb. So that word vitrify is really important. So like most people, if you were to look at all those stones and you think you run your hands over there, they're going to be coarse, like sandpaper. But that wasn't the case. And now, interestingly enough, Tim, and, and pun intended on this, as you get back from the Peruvian expedition, editing it to go in, and listen to this, Cam, this will blow your mind. The fact is, is that within three or four days, they're announcing publicly the presence of mercury in its refined form, not just uh, you know cinnabar or something that's refined into mercury, but mercury in its refined form, and it's always located in areas where history states, uh, you know, ancient history, call it legend, call it myth, that there was a huge, if you will, post-flood atomic war and pre-flood atomic war. Mm -hmm. So when Tim said, wasn't that? Is it fair to say? that that was probably one of the most unusual things that you came away from uh, just in touching that stone that you've never heard before, that's never been discussed before, and it's as relevant as, and forgive me, it's as relevant as a revelation now of all these finds are coming to the forefront. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, I've heard people talk about that they're incredibly smooth, but, and I don't know if, uh, if some of the explorers and researchers have, have have specifically mentioned the vitrification, but I don't believe they have. They, Mario, uh, again, the engineer, the Peruvian engineer from the University in Puno, uh, he believes he has proof that they melted, that they were able to melt the surface of the rocks, or add some kind of a mineral layer or sand maybe, and melt that on top. And he shows in the video, he points out what he believes. Uh, is evidence where the surface has been rubbed off. In other words, it's a layer. And, uh, and, and by the way, we found this kind of construction also in Sardinia, except in Sardinia they were using layers of quartz. So uh, this, this idea of either vitrifying the surface or, or crystallizing the surface seems to be a te an antediluvian technology that was ubiquitous. It was universal. People knew there was some reason they did this. Um, obviously, it's um, aesthetically a pleasing, uh, pleasing, but I'm sure that it also had some kind of a technical purpose as well. So I know we're coming up on the break here. When we get to the other side of the break here, I'll describe now what's on the other side, what I consider to be the post-flood construction, and what's going on there with uh, what Steve mentioned in terms of the, uh, the uh, moving around of the, uh, of the artifacts. Just fascinating. Yeah. I, well, before you go any further, I just want to mention that uh, in Steve Quayle's book, Genesis Six Giants, uh, Steve, you go into the first nuclear age where you talk about uh, where you talk about vitrified sand in the uh, uh, well, the um, and as you mentioned before, the ancient Indian flying machines. Uh, but, but but what really got 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 me interested here is this vitrified sand um, superheated very quickly, forming a 
uh, glass, green glass, and such. Uh, uh, Tim, this is what you're—I t- mean, this is what you're referring to, right? Uh, uh, just to be clear, um, that, that, that could very well have been. You're talking about superheated. Are we? Could we? Technologies uh, superheated. Were, were, yeah, yeah. Could could we not be talking about a nuclear weapon uh, of sorts or nuclear energy uh, of sorts? Well, yeah. They, they, like Steve said, they had to have used an extremely intense energy source that would produce extremely intense heat. That's the only okay. way you can vitrify, especially if you're talking about the surface of rock and the site. Okay. Yeah. That, that's. I just want to make sure that yeah, I was on the right page. So obviously, folks, yep. there's a lot here. Absolutely uh, amazing. We're again. We're talking with Steve Quayle from SteveQuayle.com and Tim Alberino, the Alberino analysis by Steve Quayle from SteveQuayle.com and Tim Alberino of the Alberino analysis, talking about his recent trip to South America and uh, with particular focus on Peru. And we were talking in the first hour of some of the discoveries he made, some of the encounters that he had, and the oppressiveness, especially, you said, Tim, the government oppressiveness when you and your team entered into Bolivia. Um, I mean, that's that's fascinating yes. and dangerous stuff. I know the uh, what you, you seek to find is what, and, and uh, you know, uncovering and unearthing this information and these truths uh, for the Lord are what drives you to do this, but you ever find yourself scared or having to um, just pray to the Lord and say, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm in over my head, Lord. I, you know, you got to get me out of here. Yeah, the whole time we were in Bolivia, <laughs> we were pretty nervous. All three of us, all three of us, Great were hand. pretty nervous in Bolivia because you know, last thing we wanted was to end up in a Bolivian slammer. You know, so oh. uh, it, it, it was uh, it was touch and go to say the least. Uh, at certain parts of that uh, of the of the Bolivia part of our expedition, man. That, well, I want to yeah, I want to throw something in. Hey, Doug, I want to yeah, let everybody ahead. know too that uh, uh, Pastor Bruce York's entire congregation and Susan and his wife were praying for their protection. I remember asking Romy and being on the phone with Romy, praying for their protection, covering them, and asking God to block them. Here's here's what I think people have got to understand and. Boy, Lord, help me to communicate this. I can tell you from personal experience that this is the most secret stuff in the world. How can you say that, Steve? Simple. When I get contacted with guys that have four stars and more, and basically, um, how do I say this? Uh, i got to leave it at that, or I'll say too much. I'm not trying to be mysterious, okay? And I get contacted by guys who show up at my store with cosmic clearance if you don't know what that is top secrets 28 levels below that the point that is really critical or when i talk to a man who is handpicked by dr teller god bless you my brother and i won't even say his name or initials and he basically has been dealing with core reality here's what core reality boils down to in a nutshell true ancient history stargates and aliens and guess what you can't separate them all probably the closest guy that ever came to really nailing that in a film and i'd say accurately was chris carter in the x-files movie not the x-files series uh, some of that stuff's real too so why am i saying this and and i believe this is why god spoke to a a couple a dear couple that and i mean they could have they could have taken their money and gone any place with it but when they called me, actually sent me an email and said, God laid this on our heart. Here's why God wants this stuff known. There's nothing that has, not, uh, that has been hidden that will not be revealed. The reason why the slaughter of Christians and, uh, and the uh, necessary removal of them all in the United States is so that they can bring on the ultimate deception. Doug, here's a simple question for you in your investigator days. Who is it that stands against right now the revelation in, you know, of that we were not created by God, that Jesus is not the Son of God? Now, that's what they're saying. I obviously don't believe that. And the fact is, is that the aliens created us. They're coming back to save us and uh, to serve mankind. Unfortunately, they're going to be serving us up on a, a banquet table, and they're going to be, you know, uh, most likely... Uh, turning us into a food source, 
Well, the answer always goes back. If I said that to you immediately, what's the first thing that comes to your mind, Doug? Well, Lucifer, Luciferians, uh, yeah, I mean, anyone with with an anti-biblical agenda. I mean, Satan, there you go. Satan, you know, I mean, the list is growing daily, it seems. Yeah, and so this is what, boy, I'll tell you what, and and uh, and this is what Tim even encountered in Sardinia. Tim, I want you to share just who it was, because even in Peru, is it accurate to say that when you asked who was covering it up, the answer in the uh, uh, Reed Islands on Lake Titicaca were the same as the elderly people in Sardinia? It goes right back to the Vatican, does it not? Well, in Cusco, when we talked to the people in Cusco, yeah. Cusco, uh, I'm sorry, we were also in Cusco concerning some of the uh, the amazing sites around Cusco. When we we found out, we literally found out. wasn't even just asking people. We went and found out ourselves that the Vatican. I mean, I call Cusco now the 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 Vatican of Peru. I mean, it, it, or I should say, the Vatican of South America, because that's what it is. When you're there, you realize, wow. We are, you know, this is a Catholic, this is a Vatican stronghold. And that's another thing that you don't hear anybody saying, but you're hearing it from me tonight. Cusco is a Vatican stronghold, precisely because of what it's sitting on top of. And and I think that, that's just so, so you know, so Doug, I was with Tom. Yeah, yeah, I think, I don't know, somebody cut out, but, but when I was with Tom Horn over the weekend, Tom told me an amazing story. When they were leaving Mount Graham, they stopped in. That's in Arizona. This is related to what Tim is talking about right now. When they were leaving, they stopped at a little, I think, a restaurant, and they, the, the guy came out, and they were talking about Mount Graham. He says, well, did they tell you that the Pope came here in a quiet uh, delegation to uh, in a helicopter to go and take a look at what's coming through their telescopes? Now, Tom hasn't said that publicly. He'll probably say that on your show on May 5th. For those, I don't know if you've announced that yet, but uh, Chris Putnam, who, by the way, I met, and Chris is a classic sense of the word, you know, uh, a scholar because he's reading his Hebrew right to left. He's got his Greek lexicon up there, and uh, he, he's a very, very, very competent linguist. But saying all that, I, it just dawned on me, okay, when when Tim touched down in Sardinia, they were followed by the guy. The Sardinians, I'm going to make this short, Tim, and turn right back to you. The Sardinians made it clear, almost scared to death, in the case of a certain individual you met with, a couple individuals. You go to Cusco, that same thing is there and present. Now, saying all that, Tom says that uh, the gentleman said, yeah, the, the Pope showed up. That was never announced publicly. It was never even intimated publicly, yet it happened. So, okay, someone says, well, I don't believe it unless it's in the newspapers. Well, i got to tell you something. You're already brain dead if you believe that. Anybody who is doing anything surreptitiously is going to publish it or ever tell the truth. So take it from there, Tim. Exactly. Just the whole, what we're dealing on now is the cover-up. Remember I said this. This is the core reality. Share, share from Sardinia the following and the fear, and then take it to Cusco. Okay. Let me finish up the uh, the difference between Puma Punku and Tiwanaku for people. Who oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that. go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't. I forgot uh, about that. So to return to that to the whole Puma Punku situation, uh, just so that to, to close that out, and so people understand um, understand how the situation is there. Basically, as I said about Puma Punku, uh, the, everything at Puma Punku is under the ground. There's no doubt about it. It's under the ground. All that they're showing is the tip of the iceberg, and they're not at least on the surface, interested in going any deeper, although I'm sure all, all kinds of stuff are, is going on on the ground. Um, but if you walk 200 yards or so uh, uh, from Puma Punku across the way, you're in the area now that is referred to generally as Tiawanaco. Over in that area, there's a distinction. Everything you find at Tiawanaco, most of what you find at Tiawanaco is above ground and is inferior to Puma Punku. And that is evident immediately. Tiwanaku is inferior in terms of the, uh, the uh, technology employed to build it. It is a typical sort of uh, post-flood uh, construction with big blocks, but not the same kind of precision you find over Pumapunku. And it looks like whoever built Tiwanaku was trying to copy or emulate what was done in Pumapunku. So, 
this is something that has been pointed out, even on Ancient Aliens and different programs, that Puma Punku is obviously uh, older and obviously employed uh, more advanced technology uh, than Tiawanaku. However, what I found out is that the government of Bolivia has only one sanctioned narrative on the whole area. And all the guides have to say the same thing, and they're very, very aggressive about forcing their narrative on everybody. And this is something that you don't know unless you go there. And that narrative is that Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, there's really no difference. There's nothing to see here. This is the same kind of a deal, same kind of a civilization. Maybe Pumapunku is a little older, same kind of technology. There's nothing to see here. Don't you know, ask any questions. That's, that's the attitude, and it's very aggressively enforced. And so, in fact, when you're over in the Tiwanaku side, that's newer, that's, that is, in my opinion, post-flood, and then the, Puma Puma, the Pumapunku side is pre-flood, uh, the Tiwanaku side, you actually find uh, blocks of andesite, because the Tiwanaku side is almost exclusively sandstone. You, you find blocks of andesite that were obviously brought over from Pumapunku, carried over and strategically placed uh, on top of rocks and right like on the corner of a walkway, right where the tourists would notice them. And furthermore, when you go up into the, uh, the temple of uh, Kalasasaya over there, which is people just refer to it as Tiwanaku, the temple of Tiwanaku, that's where the, 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 uh, the so-called gate of the sun is um, located, is up in that temple. But first of all, the government did a big, big restoration over there. And they won't tell you that. We found that out uh, uh, while we were there. They did a restoration, but they don't want anybody to know for some reason. They rebuilt a lot of Tiwanaku. Now, isn't this interesting? They rebuilt a lot of Tiwanaku. They're excavating a lot of Tiwanaku. That's where most of the excavation is. That's where they're trying to push all the tourists over to that side. They leave the more astounding situation, Pumapunku, under the ground, but they go excavating everything that is post-flood and trying to make you think that it's the same thing. In fact, the Gate of the Sun is, uh, the famous Gate of the Sun over in Tiwanaku is is basically wrought from one gigantic block of andesite, one solid block of andesite. This thing is cut out of andesite, which, again, is extremely uh, hard. And it belongs over in Pumapunku. Not many people know this, and I've never heard anybody acknowledge this. And, and to these guys' credit that go over there and shoot these videos, I guarantee they got to pull permits, and I guarantee you that they've got officials that are standing there and making sure that what they say, you know, it, it basically are there to, to, to make sure they don't say certain things. So I don't know if, if, if this is something that's been overlooked, if people haven't noticed this, or if they've had to keep quiet about it, but it is obvious that artifacts from Puma Punku have been carried over and placed in Tiwanaku, strategically placed over there. And the guides, if you listen to the guides walking around, for example, there's a famous monolith uh, made out of solid uh, andesite right in the middle of the uh, Kalasasaya temple in Tiwanaku, and that this, this monolith, they, all the guides, it's, it's comical, all the guides have to say when they walk up to this monolith, I stood there and listened to them. This is an original monolith. This was here originally. This is exactly how it was discovered. This is exactly where it was. They, had, they all said that. when they came. I'm thinking how bizarre that they all have to say that when they come up to this monolith that is made of, uh, that is made of andesite that obviously belongs in Pumapunku. Why do I say that? Because there are other monoliths in Tiwanaku that are imitations of the andesite ones, and they're made out of sandstone, which is much softer and much easier to work with. And the technology is, is far inferior to what's over at Pumapunku. Furthermore, our engineer Mario told us that he knows for a fact that these artifacts, namely the, the, the andesite artifacts from Pumapunku, the monoliths, the blocks, and the uh, Gate of the Sun, 
were brought over, and he, I think he even mentioned the year, some, sometime way back in the 60s or something, right when people were just beginning to, 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 to get interested in the site, they were brought over and strategically placed and positioned in Tiawanako. So here's the question. Why the deception? Why? I think we know the answer. But, but why the deception? Why go to such great lengths to move these massive andesite artifacts that weigh hundreds of tons, place them over where they don't belong, and then tell, make all the guides say that these are original, these were here? Why? Obviously, there's a cover-up. There's a reason. Uh, one can only assume that it's because they don't really want you to think about what's under the ground. They want you to concentrate on what's above the ground. And That's that like tampering is the sense that we got. Yeah, I mean, I mean, t- exactly. Tim, that, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. You can, you can, uh, and Steve, uh, when we were called out to do blood, uh, blood stain pattern analysis, it would be very easy to see um, when a crime scene. Well, not easy, but you have to know what you're looking for for uh, you know for a crime scene to be tampered with. But there's always a very um, under. I mean, it's a very serious underlying reason because when you do that, Tim and, and Steve. Um, the stakes are extremely high. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, listen to what Mr. Alberino is saying. And, and the misdirection this, uh, aspect, too. You know, you mentioned the ancient astronaut theorists and their TV shows and all the quote-unquote evidence they unearth and claim to unearth. Well, why wouldn't this be something that, you know, would also be Exactly. Unearthed? And it's the misdirection. Exactly. And, and, and you know what, Joe? These guys actually say they make the claim, some of them, not all of them, I've heard the claim made that the gate of the sun over in Tiwanaku, in the temple there in Kalasasaya over there, is a gateway that when you go through it, it takes you to Pumapuku. And standing there, I thought, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just just a ridiculous concoction. Listen, here's the deal. These guys reject the biblical narrative that is true and logical, and the story is there. They reject it, so the only way they can put the pieces together is to concoct wild, speculative crap about everything that they're looking at. They reject the truth, so they have to put these pieces together, and that's, I mean, it's, it's, it is evident, I'm telling you, the magic of, of, uh, of television, basically, you know, it works for them. They can get away with it, but when you're actually standing in front of the gate of the sun looking at this thing, What's in your mind, if you have a proper perspective on the ancient world, is this does not belong here, but they want you to think that it does. In fact, we were noticing this, and uh, our team, uh, the three of us, were discussing this, and, uh, and, you know, obviously out loud, we were kind of whispering about it, and, and some of the other tourists were kind of coming up and listening to what we were saying and kind of were intrigued, and we started to feel like, uh-oh, we better get out of here pretty soon because that's when we started really getting yelled at over there and, and correct and not, uh, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, they've got over at the, the ruins now, uh, they, I think probably because of all the attention that's been put on Puma Punku and, and, and Tiwanaku, they've got, um, I refer to them as ruin Nazis. They walk around with these uh, uh, bullhorns and, and, and they have these phones in their pockets and they, and, and if you, if you get too close to something or you step on something or you're asking certain kind of questions, uh, you know, or you're, 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 you know, not, not, not doing what you're supposed to be doing over there as a tourist, what they expect you to be doing, which is just be brainless and go, oh, wow, this is interesting, and just accept their narrative, they, they I mean, they're on you like a hawk over there. Uh, they bullhorn you. They yell at you. They pull out their phone and take pictures of you. Um, and they were getting extremely agitated. And I'm, I'm convinced, and I think so are the other two guys of, that were on our team, I'm convinced that they have people there that, understood, that could understand English so that they could understand what you're saying about the artifacts, so, you know, to report you if you're starting to say things that they don't like. And uh, so we got bullhorned a lot, and uh, we're being followed. And we, I mean, there were all kind of tourists there. Uh, it wasn't packed, but there, there, were, there were handfuls of tourists here and there. But those guys were honed in on us, and, uh, and you know, so we, we, we were kind of getting nervous out there, um, and we decided to, to call it quits after, after a certain point. But the point is that there's, there's an obvious cover-up going on over there, and they've obviously moved artifacts, 
and this was done this wasn't done recently this was done years and years and years ago they obviously have not delved any deeper at least on the surface into the more interesting part of Tiwanaku which is Puma Punku and they're obviously trying to channel everybody and uh, all the intrigue and all the questions about the area they're trying to keep them based on what's on the surface and what they're uncovering they're 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 excavating a couple more pyramids out there but they won't talk about the one that they're excavating under the ground i realized that they were only talking about the one that the one that they were excavating above the ground and the ones that they're excavating above the ground i'm i'm fairly convinced that those are all uh uh, post-flood constructions. Now, here's the thing. When you're standing in Tiwanaku, you're standing in a massive valley that is bordered by mountains. I mean, you're in the Andes. You're 13,000 feet above sea level, and you're in a plain. And, and basically, all you're in a very wide, broad plain. And the sense that I, at least the sense that I got, and, and, and in fact, uh, our whole team had, was that in truth, if you were to dig down anywhere in that plane, you would hit the kind of artifacts that are found at Puma Punku. I got the sense that the whole thing is some kind of gigantic city, I mean, with pyramids and everything, and that what you see in Puma Punku is the top of a structure. It's, it's, it's just the very, like I keep saying, the tip of the iceberg. I think that there is an underground antediluvian city underneath the dirt there. And by the way, well, how did it get covered up? It's almost universally agreed that a flood brought in sediment and washed over all of the, uh, all of the Puma Punku older ruins, that, that it had to be a flood. It brought in all of this extra dirt and sediment and deposited it in that belly. Of course, it was the flood of Noah. I mean, that is the most logical inference that anyone can make. It was the Great Flood. It deposited all that sediment there. People will say, oh, it was, it was Lake Titicaca flooded. But listen, to flood that whole valley that we were in, in fact, to flood the whole Altiplano, I mean, it has to be massive amounts of water to flood that whole area. And it is obvious that the entire area was flooded. So uh, what is the, e the, the, the best, most logical and easiest and most natural explanation? There was an antediluvian uh, society living there in the whole Altiplano. There were giants. There was uh, high technology um, fallen angel activity, a very large advanced civilization that was decimated in the great flood of Noah, probably decimated before the great flood of Noah in a great battle between the, 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 the giants, as the book of Enoch talks about, and then completely washed over by the flood of Noah. And that was, by the way, part of the purpose of the flood of Noah was to bury this stuff. It was intentional on God's part to bury this stuff to bury the technology, to bury the knowledge of the, wa of the watchers, of the fallen angels. And that's precisely what we find. I mean, if you go out there and concoct stuff about a aliens and this and that, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it, it really is ridiculous. And, you know, I mean, you're standing on evidence for, for the biblical narrative, and that's why we went for the audience. That's why we went. We're coming with the biblical perspective. We understand what ancient history truly looked like, uh, the technology, the fallen angels, the giants, and everywhere we go, we get con we we find confirmation of it. Wow, fantastic! Wow. Steve. Well, yeah, and Doug, I think the thing that again that's relevant, bringing it back, this is the time that these things will be revealed. This is a time that it's critical for people to understand that it doesn't matter what country you're in. They can. There, there comes a point. I don't know. They can put all the Nazis in the world on the border, but when God says enough is enough, it's just like all of the volcanoes going off, all of the flying saucers going off. It, it's like the technology of the ancients is coming into the foreground. And again, we're, we're now seeing an acceleration unlike any time uh, in the history of the world. Because it's the time, Pastor David Langford did that study on a specific time in general time. There's a Karyos and then there's a Kronos. So the point being is, is that this is the time for this stuff in South America to be revealed. Now, Tim, I want you to share, and again, if people want to start sending in their questions, I want you to share just how 
cool this was that God gave you a platform, and we can go back and jump around and stuff. But you know, we found out that one of the share with one of the with the people that how and I said before I don't know if you were on the radio or I said to a Doug when we weren't both on Tim, but I, said, I thought it was interesting how a certain archaeologist was supposed to take you to what you guys were told was you know uh, basically up in the mountains of the cloud forest to see the giant bones and how basically by the time he gets from Lima to where you're at and wherever you were at at the time, he, he kind of pulls the, uh, gee, I don't know anything thing. Share with the people how that came down, what you were told before, what you were told when you get there, because, again, you don't know how powerful, the most powerful people in the world are until they threaten you and or your family or, you know, basically friends you've known and scholars you've worked alongside of disappear. So share that. And then then if you would go into the whole thing about how the Lord opened the door for you to address the, uh, was it University of Lima or whatever? Yeah, well, we, uh, yeah, we were, we were told that uh, a very um, famous guy in Peru, very famous, uh, a prominent um, archaeologist was going to meet with us and basically show us where the giant bones are hidden. And uh, obviously we're very excited about that, but the whole thing fell through and the guy claimed that he didn't know anything ab- about it when we actually met with him. So I, we're not 100% sure what happened, uh, if we were just being deceived, if they were trying to get something out of us, but uh, uh, it was a very bizarre kind of situation. Obviously disappointing for us, but, um, uh, but we documented so much. That was at the end of our trip. We had already documented so much amazing stuff up until that point that it really didn't matter that much because we just kind of switched gears. I was invited to speak at the uh, university of San Martin in, uh, in the city of Terrapoto in the, in, in the, uh, in the, um, the high jungle of the Amazon basin in Peru. And, uh, uh, we went and we did that. And it was, uh, uh, basically a little conference that they put together in the, in the university. And, uh, I, I presented the, 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 the biblical viewpoint, the biblical narrative, the, the Genesis 6 narrative. And uh, because part of what we're doing as Gen 6 Productions is, is not only are we exploring, um, not only are we investigating, but we're also educating. And so they had never heard the, the, the biblical narrative the way that uh, I presented it there in the university. I did a little presentation, which is in the documentary, and – uh, they had never heard the biblical narrative in, in terms of giants and fallen angels and technology and the pre-flood world. And uh, this was new to them. Now, interestingly enough, everybody knew about the ancient aliens. Everybody knew about, you know, the Anunnaki. Uh, but the biblical narrative was not never presented. I mean, think about that. And, and uh, in Peru, there are thousands and thousands of evangelical churches. And yet nobody has an answer none of these churches are have ever given an, a biblical answer for all this stuff that's lying all over the place in peru so so the narrative in peru is the anunnaki the the, the ancient aliens uh you know it's incredible even the archaeologists this is this is a funny this is a funny little fact that i found out over there we would meet with archaeologists um uh, very well respected archaeologists and i would ask them what do the, uh, you know, then they would always tell us, well, you know, convention, the conventional uh, historical perspective. That's what they would always tell me when I say, you know, what about Pumapunku? What about Saksaiwaman? What about Ojantai Tambo? How is it possible that, that the ancients, without, the, without the, even the, the, uh, the benefit of the wheel, were able to move and were able to quarry and move and craft these these gigantic megalithic stones and set them into place. I mean, what, how do you explain this? And the archaeologists would always tell me, well, you know, ropes and thousands of men and hundreds of years. You want to know how they explain anything on this planet? Ropes? No, here, I'll tell you right now. Logs, ropes, thousands of men and hundreds of years. They, they will explain anything with that formula. I'm telling you, anything. Uh, logs, ropes, thousands of men and hundreds of years there. That's how they did it. That's what they tell you everywhere. It's a joke. And you know what? I found out that they know it's a joke because when I press them further and I say, wait a minute, you know that that's impossible. They, they concede. All the professionals I talk to, they concede. And, 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 I, and I push them further. So what's the answer? And what do you think they say? The aliens did it. 
And I'm talking about the professionals. The aliens did it. I mean, they won't say that in their books. They won't say that on television. But in private, when you really get them corner and you say, you know, this is illogical. This can't be done. You know better as a professional. You're right. You know, the best explanation we have is aliens. So that's what you find uh, when, you, when, you, when you press these guys. And one of the guys that I, that I talked to is a famous archaeologist who's he's set to be in, uh, uh, giving, a, giving a talk in Washington, D.C. next month. So the guy's big time. And uh, that was, that was the, the, the explanation, again, when you corner them, aliens. So obviously there's a need for what we're doing. I mean, the biblical narrative puts all the pieces together. It does. It makes sense. It's logical. It's scientifically logical. It works. The models work. The flood, the antediluvian world, it answers everything, and that is precisely why they don't want anybody to know about it. That is precisely why the sons of Seth theory is so dangerous and, uh, and why a rejection of the, the narrative of Genesis 6 uh, is, is so detrimental because the rejection of the truth, even if people say, and people often say this to me, well, who cares? What does it really matter, you know, if people know about the giants and the fallen angels and the technology and the ancient civilizations? What does it really matter? It doesn't have any bearing on the gospel. It doesn't have any bearing on, on Christianity. Who cares? Well, now we're seeing why it matters, because people are being deceived. And when the church doesn't give an answer, the aliens did it. That becomes the narrative, because a lot of believers, believe, you know, this is sort of a subject that they don't even know what to deal with, because they cannot conceive of an ancient world that was in possession of high technology under the tutorship and, 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 and uh, of, of uh, fallen angels using this forbidden knowledge and the giants and, the, and, the, and all this kind of stuff. That is true. That is the fact of history. That's what's being covered up. And, and, and it has been carefully, it is being in our day right now, it is carefully being uh, um, covered up and switched out with the lie of the ancient aliens and the Anunnaki and so forth. So it was a, it was a privilege for us to go down and speak to the university. It was the first time they ever heard anything like this. And, um, and, and, you know, and I thank God that as, you know, as Gen 6 productions that we have the opportunity to do that because that's the most fulfilling thing uh, for us. And, 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 and I know I speak for Steve when I say that, you know, when we carry this message, we're not just carrying the message of Genesis 6, we're carrying the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it confirms and affirms the Bible. The whole story, the whole counsel of Scripture is confirmed when you start, this, when you start in the book of Genesis and you work your way all the way up to Revelation. Everything fits together. Everything. And... Uh, and so, again, it was, uh, it was a real privilege for us to be able to do that at conference. Yeah, uh, well, I, I just, uh, that, that, that's what this is all about. Uh, I got a question earlier today. You know, with all of the things happening in the world today, why this subject? And this subject, uh, and I think Tim just so eloquently explained why, because the deception that we're going to be facing, and we are facing, is going to, I mean, the roots of the deception, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Steve, but the roots of deception will be and are in Genesis, the very aspect of the Bible, because uh, Tim is uh, verifying the authenticity, the legitimacy of the literal, literal interpretation of the Bible. So, uh, as well, yeah, and, and it's like... Doug, that question presupposes that a person has no clue between cause and effect. I'm not trying to be unkind or anything in that statement. The, the problem with Christendom is they have only dealt with the fruit of evil and not the root of evil. The, the riots going on tonight, all the events taking place across the country, this is all being orchestrated for a purpose. The purpose is the ultimate destruction of the human race. You want to argue with anybody? Argue with Jesus. The point is, he said, if those days, these days, not those days, forgive me, these days were in short and there'd be no flesh left alive. It's like the question I get, well, why do you even want to talk about uh, 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 genetic engineering or singularity or, you know, they slaughter those words, but transhumanism, that's not relevant 
Oh, yes, it is. You're an albatross, ma'am. You, and I'm, I'm speaking, you know, generally now. Or, sir, you don't get it. You think because you're 75, maybe 80, or even 65 going on 100, the point, you know, that's an attitude thing. The thing is, is that you can't, yeah, you, you know, a, a, another attempt at humor. The bottom line is, is that, that it won't, if it doesn't affect them, why should they care? It's that attitude that has brought your children, ladies and gentlemen, to ruin nation. It is that attitude that instead of the, the highway to heaven, it's literally taking them the highway to hell you know who's only you know it's funny do you know who's telling the truth about this stuff to one extent or another and i don't play the video games but every day i get uh call of duty the only one and tim and i have talked about this and just mutually scratched our own head going do not people see this they turn little johnny or little billy or little Susie or little janie or annie loose and i'm not talking about maybe the listeners of this show but the world at large i mean when you spend a half a billion dollars on a video game do you think if satan is a prince and power of the air and do you think if he's providing the uh impetus the direction the supernatural wisdom do you think that you didn't care enough when your kids were taken away by the music of the day now you don't care enough when your kids are being taken away by the video games of the day the only ones are the ones the actually it's funny the only people dealing with truth is being presented in a virtual environment through video games and the people who could deal with truth based on the word of god are basically too set in their ways to think any of this stuff is relevant. You cannot understand the fruit of evil until you deal with the root of evil. For instance, this whole situation now, does it take anybody's uh, thought process to go beyond that someone killed, as usual, a poor, and, and in this case, a black man that had, had done nothing, and now there's rioting, and now you've got the Crips and the Bloods, two gangs, which, by the way, have been secretly funded in some dimension or another, either known to them or unknown to them, and the Nation of Islam coming together? Uh, hello, can anybody see that? And then if you've got the Mexican drug cartels joining with ISIS, ISIL, whatever, hello, can you see that? Here's the thing. These entities that set this ball in motion are soon to be released to carry it to their, what they believe is logical conclusion. That's war with God and war against God's people. I'd say, Doug, that's a pretty important issue. You know, and, and this is what I want to make this clear. Gen 6 Productions, if you were to say, how are you going to spend, Steve, the last uh, uh, hours, weeks, months, years, whatever God gives me, is going to be to put it into a logical and sequential way. I told Tom Horn, and Tim, I haven't had a chance to tell you this, but I said, we have to find somebody that can set up a, a curriculum, a biblical-based curriculum that can be you know, uh, made available to everybody, and so that they can understand systematically the origin of spiritual warfare. Now, I want to put out one more time, uh, probably for the hundredth time, for those of you that really want to get it, and get it right and quickly, I would urge you to go on DerekPrince.org, D-E-R-E-K-P-R-I-N-C-E.org, and order the Spiritual Conflict Series. When anybody asked me, what gave you your start, Steve, in this whole area, it was that. For once, instantly, instantly, I think it was the mercy of God and my calling, but the point being, he lays it out so consistently, so linearly. He, you know, Derek Prince was a Hebrew, Greek, Latin scholar, trained in Oxford, filled with the Holy Ghost, very, very uh, systematic, a wonderful man of God. And there are many people listening to this broadcast tonight who, like me, came out of the Jesus movement, and God used him to train a bunch of long-haired uh, social outcasts 
and people that, uh, you know, mainstream church would not like to have sitting next to them in a pew, and God did the inevitable, and that's what he's going to do, too. I hear all these stories. I get asked, I was asked it the other day, don't you believe there's going to be a mighty revival? It won't happen between four walls in a building with a church, a steeple, and all the people. It's going to happen on the streets. It's going to happen in your homes. It's going to happen wherever the power of God manifests. And so, Doug, when you get the emails, I get the emails. And by the way, when I get emails, they're from people saying, thank you for explaining all these ancient artifacts. Do you think if 90% of reality TV is basically pushing the alien agenda, if everything Tom Horn and Chris Putnam have written about in Exo Vaticana, in uh, The Road to the Immortals, by the way, that's an amazing <laughs> book, uh, the point being is, is that do you think this is not relevant? And Oh, by the way, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam did say the former pope was going to resign. Oh, gee, they just must have had a lucky guess. You know, here's the deal. Quit fighting so hard and say, Lord, teach me. I tell people, take everything Tim Alberino, you know, says to the Lord. Take everything I say to the Lord. And I believe people are going to be blown away because the documentary, when it goes into editing, it's not like on talk radio, you know. This thing is going to be fast moving. It's going to be incredibly informative. And by the grace of God, it's going to be true to the Word of God. I don't think, Tim, people really understand what the Lord did for you by opening up a university to the uh, science department and the graduate students and those who attended the symposium. That, and hear me, ladies and gentlemen, that's the first time, according to them, they've ever heard the gospel. I told our benefactors, I said, I, again, I said, Cam and, 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 and Jan, I said, thank you guys for, for being obedient to the Holy Ghost, because he said to me, this is one of the guys that donated to this project, it would have never come off had it not happened. And the point being is, is that he wanted to make a difference in the closing time period of, 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 you know, whether we've got days or months, whatever, but, you know, it's no longer, it's no longer the end is near, the end is here. So who knows? I've got people in the outback emailing me today. Thank you for dealing this with uh, these questions. By the way, it explains a lot of Australian myths and legends, too, what we're talking about. So I would encourage everybody, listen, the 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 time is here now if you you know pray about it those of you that really you know want to get involved in something you can't go because of your age and you want to stand with us in this we're going to absolutely try and get six different episodes and we won't tell where we're off to next probably the next time you won't hear about it you'll start seeing as, as soon as we can get them edited and into post production everything you're going to see some amazing stuff and uh tim just for instance give people an understanding of uh Sakseyama and what ojan totambo just you know those are those are amazing things that how the rocks had to literally be poured into each other to fit you know, show yeah, them on uh, that. Uh, I would say that out of everything that I saw uh, on this expedition, the most impressive was Saksaiwaman. Saksaiwaman is an ancient it's an ancient fortress located right outside of Cusco. Uh, it's literally sitting up, uh, um, basically on the mountainside or up on the on the on the plateau, overlooking Cusco, and uh, and. Obviously, Cusco was strategically settled by the Inca where it is, not because the Inca thought that that was a good place uh, that, that was uh, appropriate for defense of their capital city or because of the natural resources. It is apparent to me that they settled right on top of whatever antediluvian society, whatever antediluvian culture used to be there, and they literally built their city on top of what they found. You won't hear that if you go there. You won't hear anybody talk about that. Uh, everybody in Cusco, because it's the pride of Peru, Cusco is the pride of Peru, is um, everybody uh, will tell you it's all Inca. The Inca did everything. It is a lie. And, again, if you, if you corner these guys, these guides, and if you corner the archaeologists and if you corner the engineers, they will tell you in private, you're right, it couldn't have been the Inca. That they will concede in private that there's no way it could have been the Inca, that the Inca did, in fact, build on top. So I'm saying that because Sacsayhuaman is a really good example uh, of that fact, and, and we document it. And Sacsayhuaman, for people who aren't familiar with it, is 
Uh, in terms of megalithic structures, aside maybe from what was discovered recently way out in Siberia, I think it was in Siberia and Russia, the humongous stones out there, Saksaiwaman is, is the most impressive megalithic site that I've ever seen, uh, definitely that I've ever seen personally, but even that I'm aware of, perhaps maybe uh, aside from uh, Belbek, but I think it's at least on the same level. Saks, the, 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 the stones that are incorporated in the walls uh, of Saksaiwaman are so incredibly massive and they're fitted together so precisely uh, that you can't, you can't slip a piece of paper or a blade between, between a lot of the fittings or at least the way that they used to be. A lot of them are still uh, in their original configuration, the ones that haven't been shaken out of place. And it's, it's just, it is literally, and I think I say this in the documentary, it's, it is inconceivable to the human mind how that can be done. That's my stance. When I stand in front of the Saksai Waman, I don't think about logs and ropes and thousands of men and hundreds of years. I concede to the reality that this is inconceivable to the human mind. This technology is greater. This knowledge came from somewhere else. And uh, it, it didn't come from the Anunnaki. It came from the fallen angels. And, and the, 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 when you're standing there in front of that wall, and Saksai Waman, is, again, it's, it's, it's the remains of an old fortress, uh, pre-flood, I believe, pre-flood fortress. Uh, when you're standing in front of that wall, I mean, you literally feel like you're staring at, you know, you're staring, you're staring and you're touching something that was built in the days before the flood, possibly, possibly, you know, in the times when Adam was still alive, definitely Enoch. And, you know, and you're touching these stones and you're looking at it and, it, and it really brings the story of the Bible to life. The story, unfortunately, as we were saying, that so many Christians reject out of hand or ignore, uh, that story becomes living. It's, it's alive in front of you. And I, and I was just standing there imagining what this thing would have looked like. Only the bottom level, basically the, the two bottom levels are left intact and the walls intact and the walls have been um, uh, the smaller stones, because it goes from big, huge stones and gradually gets smaller. The smaller stones in Saksaiwaman and in all of the ruins around uh, Cusco have been taken, were taken by the Spanish, the ones that they could manage. They took and they built their churches and they built their homes in Cusco after they conquered the Inca. And so what's left are the, are the stones that, the, that they couldn't deal with. Uh, and, and it was um, uh, Pizarro's brother, uh, when he arrived at Saksaiwaman, he, his, the, him and the general uh, uh, consensus uh, of the conquistadores, and this is a matter of history, we're going to put this in documentary, is when they saw Saksaiwaman, what was their reaction? Their reaction was the same as my reaction. It was, there's no way that these natives built this. There's no way. They did not build this. Uh, and he, they even made the comment that it appears to have been built by giants. It appears to have been built by giants. If there's anything on this planet that appears to have been built by giants, it's Saksaiwaman outside of Cusco. And furthermore, if you go down into the city of Cusco, uh, right in the city, you, you, if you're walking just around the back alleys of Cusco, you see the same construction. And, and what happened was the Inca, they found the, the ruins of this antediluvian culture. They probably thought it was a sacred place. Of course, we know those of us who are students of history, true history, understand that the post-flood generations, uh, beginning with Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, all the way to, to you know, to, to uh, uh, contemporary times, that the post-flood indigenous peoples always tried to emulate and they always adored the, 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 the pre-flood civilizations that were the legendary, the civilizations of the gods. I call it the empire of the gods. You find this in every culture. So what they do, what I found, Sardinia, Peru, everywhere I go, I find the same thing. Uh, Post-flood cultures are building on top of the, the remains of the pre-flood cultures. I'm sure that they believe that there are significant places of spiritual power and blessing from the gods and so forth. And so they build on top of them. And not only that, it's advantageous because the, the foundations of Saksaiwaman, the foundations of much of what's built in Cusco, we can't duplicate that. We can't build better foundations than the ancients did in the pre-flood world. So it's natural, it's logical that you would build on top of those foundations. That's exactly what the Inca did, and then that's what the Spanish did after the Inca. 
And, uh, and when you're walking down the streets of Cusco, and again, we illustrate this in the film, you see what's original, the original constructions that were there uh, that, the, that the Inca built on top of, and the architecture just, is just mind-blowing. And all of the structures are built on an inclination. The base of the structures are inclined inward um, uh, so that in, in, in the event of an earthquake, that it gives it more support at the base. And there's always smaller stones placed under the big ones so that the, the whole structure can shift and move. It's absolutely ingenious, absolutely ingenious. And if you look on the, literally on the other side of the street, you have what the Spaniards, they went and took the pieces of the box from Saksai Waman, and they brought them down and built their own structures. You look at the, what they built, they had to use mortar. They didn't fit them together right. And their walls are wavy, and they don't have that inclination. I mean, that right there illustrates, even though the Spaniards had their, had their you know, uh, what do you call them, their arch, archibuses or whatever you call them, their, 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 their firearms and their cannons and their steel, they could not replicate what they had found in Cusco and throughout Peru. They just simply could, even using the same building materials, they couldn't even come close to replicating it. And uh, so it's a joke that, that, you know, when people say, oh, the Inca did that. No, they didn't. They built what's on top of it, period. And, uh, and, 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 and by the way, the Inca actually admit to that, according to the Spanish Chronicles, actually admit that they didn't build a lot of that stuff, that it was the gods. In fact, while I'm, say, while I'm on that topic, Puma Punku was said in Inca legend to have been built by a race of giants that came from the gods and Puma Punku was built in one day. That's what they say. That's what their legend is. And so, um, so basically uh, the, uh, what Steve was referring to, the, uh, the, it looks like they were, those stones were poured. I, I mean, it, what, it, what it looks like is it looks like the stones were, were, were like um, um, a balls of Play-Doh or of dough. And they were they weren't you know completely uh, what's the word uh, they weren't you know uh, uh, really soft I don't know what the word is here they were pliable enough to where they could be set one on top of the other and where they could be pressed down and they would squish in in other words if there was a concave between two stones well, when you put the third one on top that third stone would would squish down into that concave. And I believe I found evidence for it because all of the stones, these massive stones, where they're, where they're missing, if you, if you look at a line of, of, the, of a wall where these, in my opinion, antediluvian uh, uh, stones are aligned, the wall ends where the stones have fallen apart or been taken out. And if you look behind or to the side of the, the stones, you find a lip. There's a lip where the rock was overhanging the one below and the one to the side of it. There's a lip. It's not a carved lip. It looks like it was squished, like Play-Doh or dough. That's exactly what it looks like. And, um, and that will be apparent in the documentary. And uh, 